Um, hello, everyone. We will start with a brief uh, introduction, as we are used to now, uh, to give you a bit of context um, for those who do not know us yet, basically, and how watching this video. Uh, first of all, welcome, and thank you for joining this uh, training session today uh, we have in live. So I'm Elizabeth Bigan. Uh, I'm 21 years old, and I'm the current Secretary General of Joint Enterprises Europe. I'm from France. And for, yeah, this is uh, us. <laughs> with two other members of Joint Enterprises Europe Executive Board, uh, we took a gap year in our studies uh, journey to live and work together full-time as volunteers and co-represent, uh, integrate and support a network of 30,000 students in oh. 14 European countries uh, for the term 2019-2020. Uh, if you actually wonder what is a general enterprise, uh, it's a non-profit organization formed and managed exclusively by university uh, students, which provide services to companies, institutions, and individuals. They are similar to real goal of enhancing the learning of its members through practical experiences. Uh, as European uh, Youth NGO, our mission is to boost the development of the General Enterprise Network, empowering students capable and committed to generate a relevant impact at three different levels, uh, in academia, in the business world, and in society, as you can see um, in this slide. Uh, since one of our development goals from our network strategy uh, is to ensure the quality of our General Enterprise um, we have launched some years ago our program called Train the Trainers uh, to train junior entrepreneurs participants to become the future European trainers. So during eight days, uh, they can benefit from more than 40 hours of training to be able to deliver interactive workshops and online training for their national network and also the whole European network, of course. Um, what is a trainer? A trainer is more focused of, uh, on a non-formal education. Uh, which implies that the trainers are joining the training as volunteers. So the process can be flexible. It's important to not only share theories, but also experiences and self-reflection. To become a trainer, it is not necessary to have much more knowledge like an expert. The most important thing is to be able to adapt a process or a methodology uh, according to an audience to give some tools to the trainees so they can apply uh, to future situations and also develop themselves. Um, yeah, and I'm kind of done with this little introduction. I will now let the floor to our GE training manager, Sarah Farias, who is working uh, for us since now January uh, to coordinate the online training system of General Enterprises Europe. Um, we are really grateful to have you in our team, Sarah. And I wish all of you guys a nice uh, learning experience together. And Sarah, you can now introduce our next trainer and training. Uh, see you thank soon, you. guys. And thank you again. Thank you, Elizabeth. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. So as Elizabeth said, my name is Sarah Farias. I'm the actual training manager uh, by NG Europe. Uh, I'm Portuguese and I'm 24 years old. I'm working in G. Europe since uh, January and I'm responsible for organizing all these trainings and to um, coordinate this department. Uh, today we have Giorgio and uh, public speaking uh, as a topic. Giorgio um, is one of the last G Europe uh, treasure and uh, <clears throat> in the last three years Giorgio has delivered a lot and thousands of uh, speeches, webinars and trainings with a lot of different people around the world. So I hope you enjoy. And if you have questions, please ask uh, Giorgio during the training or me during the training in, the, in our chat live. In the end, I will have a feedback form for you guys. And um, it's that. So Giorgio, the stage is your, it's yours. And I hope you enjoy and learn a lot, of, a lot, a lot with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm just going to try and put, because the, the my face, uh, I'll just put it normally. There we go, it's better, and I'll make it small. And uh, let me try and, no. I, I can't put my face on there, but it's not a big issue. Um, let me try and minimize this. Um, no. All right, we'll just make it, Speaker view, maybe without the face, it's not a big issue. 
All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much uh, again, Sarah, for, for the introduction and thank you for, uh, for inviting me to do uh, this training. So as I said already, I'm George Slater, as she said already, actually. Uh, I'm George Slater. I was the treasurer of 2017-2018 in Jade, and I was also head of training, alumni management, finance, and public affairs especially in the latest period, um, the latest part. I did a lot of public affairs, so I did a lot of public speeches, and um, I had the pleasure to meet a lot of people. So it was an amazing opportunity for me, and this is why also I want to share uh, basically what I've learned uh, throughout the years, and especially after my, my, my JIT experience and during my JIT experience, and, uh, and I hope you guys uh, will enjoy it. So to start, uh, I would uh, just like to to make um, a small statement saying that as we go forward, uh, we have technology that are disrupting our lives, making our social lives easier. You can use Facebook, you can use Instagram to talk to people, you can use LinkedIn. There's plenty of other ways in which we can relate to other people, but uh, the most uh, basic way, so just talking one-to-one -one or one-to-many, it's it's slowly fading a little bit, and um, in in a way it's good because you know technology is making communication faster and easier and seeming less. Uh, at the all the on the other hand, there's uh, an aspect of it which is people need to to relate to each other, and if they lose the touch and if they lose uh, the the capacity to communicate properly to people, then we, we will encounter some issues. And one of these issues, or the most uh, one of the most feared activities, is actually public speaking. And uh, I actually find public speaking very very fun. Uh, I find it interesting. I just put this picture because a lot of people don't. Um, and uh, the, the most important part of it is uh, I want you guys to enter this training without uh, mental barriers, without boundaries that you've set yourself. Um, I want to ensure that you guys come in this training with a clear mind uh, and you're ready to just take the notions in and be confident about this. It's public speaking as everything else. It's uh, something that doesn't come out of the blue something that takes time, uh, you will need to practice a lot. And most of the time you're going to have to practice. You, you can't practice at home public speaking because then once you're in front of a, uh, of a crowd, it's not the same environment. So you, you'll feel a bit different. So as everything, it needs uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of practice. And uh, without further ado, uh, I will just show you guys the agenda about an hour long. Uh, hopefully I'll try and make it a bit shorter. I want you guys to be completely focused, and then we can um, we can continue with the Q and A at the end of the session. So uh, this is probably the moment where you are now, uh, hands in your face, and uh, thinking, "Why the hell did I join this training?" But I appreciate your bravery because you want to make yourself better, and uh, let's make a start there. So the agenda, it's going to go like with common myths uh, here is because I want to, as I said already, I want to uh, make sure you guys come with a clear head without preconceptions and make sure that you understand that public speaking is actually a process and it's something you have to really, really practice. Uh, we're going to go on the fundamentals of public speaking, uh, the receiver, the sender and the message. Uh, point six, it will be structuring your public intervention. So exactly how you should approach writing a speech if you have a public intervention to make. Uh, and then we'll hop on the bridges. Bridges is another pivotal part of, of any public intervention. Uh, we're going to rhetorical figures, the do's and don'ts, and then to finish it off with the Q&A. So let's, let's make a start. Let's go with the common myths. And um, as I said already, more than once, let's smash, let's smash some mental blocks. So the first myth that I hear here and then is speakers are born, they're not made. Um, in my opinion, this is not true. Uh, and I'll tell you very easily why, because um, communicating with your friends is different from communicating with uh, someone else in a more professional manner. Um, if you speak naturally, uh, you can do a lot, but if you have to do a natural speech, 
in a professional way, then that becomes a different thing. Uh, definitely, there are some people who are born more extroverted, that have maybe more innate charisma, uh, but that does not necessarily make them better public speakers. Charisma is good to have, but it can also be a double-edged sword because charisma can also make you feel like you're doing something very well while you're not. Um, so, first of all, speakers are not born, they're made. Uh, it takes practice as everything. There's basically nothing in the world, any skill that you can do in the world that you can just learn without practice. It's practically impossible. Uh, if you have anyone, just let me know which skill is that because I want to learn that. Um, so point one, speakers are born, they're made. Uh, second point, which is also very important, is speeches must be memorized. I have a terrible memory, I can tell you that. Um, speeches do not have to be memorized for a very simple reason. Uh, because if you memorize it, you will not be natural. You will be rehearsing something that you've learned. Uh, this is a big red flag. Not because it's... Um, I mean, it's better to memorize it than to like not know what to say. But at the same time, memorizing a speech leaves the human aspect out of it and makes it kind of a little bit more artificial. So definitely, you gotta know what you're talking about, but you don't necessarily have to memorize it. And if you do memorize it, you have to be very, very good at making it look like you're not, you don't know it word by word. The third myth, uh, it's a small audience is better than a big one. This is also one that I've, I thought about, I thought about this actually uh, when I started doing uh, public intervention, and I thought, okay, the smaller the people, the better it will be. Uh, it's not quite like that. I think this is, it can be a bit subjective. Uh, this is, of course, my perspective on, on public speaking. I think a small audience is actually harder because you have, especially when it's physical, now it's online, it's a bit, I think it, it leaves a little bit out of the emotions of being on a stage. Um, but a small audience, actually, it's, I, I feel like it's more testing because there is so much more looking in the eyes of people and having a, complete, con a continuous stimuli coming with, in and out that actually it, it can distract you a little bit from the actual whatever it is, the presentation, training, whatever it is. Uh, and I feel like a bigger audience is actually a bit easier because looking at a crowd of 400 people, you will, it will be very, very hard to look everybody in the eyes and uh, and try and make you know um sort of eye contact with them to make to make themselves present so i think this is definitely the most subjective one so i find it a bit like that but most of the time a bigger audience actually makes you feel like you're more um i wouldn't say rehearsing because you're not rehearsing but it feels like you're not talking to every single person in one moment so it, it makes you more focused on the actual content of your speech rather than try and please everyone in the audience. Uh, the fourth is perfection is key. Uh, this is another one that I find interesting because I thought it was every time I used to get a word wrong and things like that, I used to, you know, everyone's, it's their own worst critic. Uh, we always, you know, take ourselves too seriously and be like, oh my god, I did this wrong, I did that wrong. Um, perfection is not the key here. Perfection, the, 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 the message that you send to, to the people in, in the audience is what's the key, because that's what they will take out of it. They won't take out of it, hey, he missed a couple of words. Uh, I also say this because we're all humans, we make mistakes. And uh, mistakes make people humans. So when you make a small mistake on the stage, it actually makes you more humane. Uh, the, the people can relate from the audience to you. And because they feel like, hey, man, a mistake is a human. Like, it, it makes them more, uh, they make, it makes them closer to you. So perfection is not the key. Uh, doing a great job is the key. And having a great message is the key. But it's not being perfect. Uh, the fifth myth, which is probably the one I prefer, is uh, silence is bad. Silence is not bad. Um, silence is a way to bring your audience to focus on the last words you've said. Sometimes 
I I could speak for you know ten minutes, and then if I had to remember something, I would go mm, uh, mm. that is much much worse, I believe, than silence. I I still do um and mm sometimes because you you're still thinking. Uh, however, when you actually need a break or need a need to focus on a couple of words or need to bring the audience attention to one particular thing silence is a great great way to get their attention because a lot of people feel uncomfortable in silence um as i, I do as well sometimes especially not only in, let's say a professional environment but more of a personal environment i feel like silence it's a bit awkward but it's not silence it, it's not necessarily awkward if you make it not awkward so if you know how to hold the silence in a big stage, you are doing very, very, very well. So having, uh, let's say, covered these myths, um, I hope that you guys have broke down some of the barriers that you thought, hey, I must have done this or I must do that. Uh, I hope this brought you a little bit more of a perspective of it's okay to not be perfect or it's okay to have some silence. Uh, and now I want to start with the real fundamentals of public speaking and we'll go on to building a little bit more into the technical parts of, of it as we go during the game. So the fundamentals of public speaking, we'll start with the uh, definition, the most basic definitions. These are two definitions I found online and it's the act or process of making speeches in public or the art of effective oral communication with an audience. It's an art, it is an art, public speaking, I completely agree. It's also an act because you are rehearsing something that you've learned yourself. You're not memorizing it, you're rehearsing it. So it is definitely a, a, a process and I'll explain you very well why it's a process. Uh, as I said here, long story short, wherever you're speaking to a group of people formally, uh, you're actually doing a public speech. So if you are in your workplace, for example, and uh, you have to present to your boss and uh, five other colleagues, that is, it's not a big audience, but it's still a public speech. You're still speaking formally and you're still trying to deliver content through your words and your body language. Um, and the, my little note down there is in most professional jobs, you actually have to do a lot of speeches. So it's better to be ready uh, early than late because the, the more you wait, the more you'll have to catch up on. And, you know, it, it's much, much better to know this early because as we go forward, my point I was making before is less and less people, I believe this is my opinion, but less and less people will be proficient public speakers. So if you're good at public speaking, you will definitely stand out because a lot of people, and I'm saying a lot of people actually fear this. Um, so as I said already, public speaking is a process and I want to put you in the perspective of a process. For example, take a process in your junior enterprise or in, in your company and uh, what are the characteristics? So all processes starts as project. So you try it, try it out and then if it brings a good outcome or you think it, it does bring an outcome, but you think it can get better, then that's the moment when it becomes a process. So it's the same for public speaking. Uh, you don't start uh, public speaking fluently. You start with a project. So think about it as your first public speech is your project, and that's the one that you're really going to try and, 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 and see how you feel and how you speak. And, and from then, then you can try and iterate and better yourself. Uh, the second is no process is perfect, as I said, even less without iterations. Um, no one's born ready, no one's born perfect. Um, so public speaking, it takes time. You have to do, do your job, do your speech, get your feedback, uh, as we're doing today. I'm getting my feedback too at the end of this training. Um, we're getting the feedback and then from the feedback, you realize, okay, I should do this right or I should do this better. Uh, and then you change it and the next time you do public speaking, you, you will try and apply the feedback. Same thing as a process in your June enterprise. Then processes have a predefined outcome. So you should know what you want to get out of the speech. Uh, if you're trying to deliver a project and um, 
you want to make sure that your client understands everything about the project and the key results, then your predefined outcome is having your client understand the success of your project. Uh, and the same thing in public speaking, you must have a, an outcome. You must know what you want to get out of it. You must know what message you want to get to your audience. Uh, it has a sequence, so everything has a sequence. Same for public speaking, and I'll go into the sequence in the next slide. And then number five is reporting back on the results. So as I said before, no process is perfect. Uh, so you have to always, always ask, ask for feedback, get the results, try and put them in the next speech and, and continue. So um, as I was saying, um, it's a process and it's a communication process. So we have the, as I was saying here, uh, we have a sequence and this is the sequence. So we have the sender on the left hand side and this is you. This is the person, it's me in this case, it's you when you will uh, deliver your public speech. Um, we have a message and that is both the verbal and non-verbal um, information that you send to the speaker, uh, to, the, to the audience, sorry. So that, as I said, includes your words, your body language, your, uh, your, your everything. When you're on the stage, everything is a stimuli for your audience, so that's your message. The encoding, that's basically uh, how you translate your message to your audience. So you encode it in, uh, you could, for example, miss your body language in a certain time. So the message could be actually distorted from your body language. So if I'm doing, if I'm talking about something very positive, and, and, and I have my arms crossed, that would be a misunderstanding of the message because I'm talking about something very good, but I'm using uh, a posture of someone who's trying to defend themselves. Uh, so in a way you have to be very clear that your message is not necessarily what the audience get, but the audience get your message after it has been encoded. Uh, the channel, uh, the channel is basically the the platform that you use to, to communicate. So it could be online, uh, it could be physical, so a stage. It's basically the, the, the mean that your message gets to the receiver, so the audience. So as I said, the receiver is the audience that is, uh, could be five people, could be 10 people, could be a hundred million, how many as you want. Uh, of course, the more people, the harder to engage everybody because there's a lot of people and everyone has different things. And when I talk about hard to engage everybody, it's most probably because of the noise. The noise is that thing on top, the little star, the orange star, and the noise uh, basically affects the encoding, the channel and the receiver. Uh, what is the noise? The noise is any external stimuli that it's not necessary and it just makes uh, understanding harder. So that can be physical like a telephone ringing in the audience uh, or it could be someone that has had a very bad day at work and so he's, his, his mind is just elsewhere. He doesn't even or she doesn't even listen to you. It's just like he's got other or she's got other things in her head and uh, and that's noise too. Um, so that affects the encoding, the channel and the receiver because the noise, it doesn't necessarily have to come from the audience. It can come from you too. You can have your own noise and, uh, and it affects the encoding part. Uh, then we got the decoding. So this is basically the opposite of the encoding. This is the receiver assimilating uh, what you've said, assimilating the message and understanding or at least interpreting what you've said and um, making their own understanding of it. So uh, this is very, very important because sometimes we think that if we say something, the people perceive exactly that and that is absolutely not the reality. Uh, every time we speak, we open, unless we are extremely precise with every single word, and the audience, it's also extremely precise and like they exactly know the wording that you're using, then that's, it's one of the, let's say the occasion in which you wouldn't be, um, let's say misinterpreted, but 
it's continuously uh, a process of I don't know if you ever played the game um, that you have to uh, say something to your friend and then there's 10 other people that say the same thing and at the end of the table there's someone who said something completely different it's that that's a game this is the real life but it's it's sort of similar because uh people can interpret messages differently so unless you're extremely clear with your wording uh probably in some way at some point your message will get distorted uh then we have the last box which is of course the feedback and the feedback is what i was talking about before so at the end of the training i'll get my own feedback and i'll use it for for the next time um and then it goes again so it's a process uh, after you got the feedback the sender um let's say the sender puts the feedback into his uh sort of uh, public speaking loop and then tries to correct and then whenever he or she is ready to do another public speaking mm, so sort of intervention then they can uh they can use the feedback for it so uh, as I said, this is all I have explained uh, in the in the previous slide. So I'll just let you guys give it a read um, so you can actually use it for reference. So then the next part of it is the receiver. The receiver is your audience, as it's written there. And as I said before, the audience it can be any size. It's usually when it's a public speech. It's usually more than two or three uh, because otherwise unless it's uh that could be a meeting rather than a speech uh but it really depends um so the receiver we'll start with uh, all the most basic part of it which is understanding why is the audience so important to you we have four main reasons at least that's the why um that's the four reasons i found more um relevant and first of all is knowing your audience will allow you to tailor your speech that is the most important thing when you are writing a speech uh, knowing in advance who you're talking to and i'm not i'm not talking about names and surnames i'm talking about the type of audience that's coming to you so i know that oh, Pardon. I know that in this training uh, there are junior entrepreneurs, so I've been a junior entrepreneur. I know a little bit um, what the junior entrepreneurs are like. I know what they want to see. I know what they don't want to see. So I tried to to tailor my public speech in this case as a training uh, to you guys so that it would be more digestible and maybe not too packed, but not shallow either. So. Uh, you have to take all these things into consideration and uh, after you understand that your audience is a certain type of person maybe there's more than one type of person uh, at that point you will be able to to tailor your speech then uh, second part is you, they're your success meter um, they are the ones that will say hey this was a good speech this was a bad speech um i mean at the end of the day they have to also appreciate or not appreciate your speech and whether they thought what they found is interesting um in the same way you are my success meter i hope that you'll find this training interesting and useful so i really 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 care about the audience because they are the biggest source of improvement because the audience are the ones that perceive you and they know and they say hey i think you could do this better i think this was great and so you can feedback that into into your speech and the last part is they're your guests uh after all they're the ones sitting there listening to you to your voice uh, so you have to host them um like you would host your friends in your house you have to be very i i tend to be then everyone is is, is different in their way of welcoming but i tend to be quite warm i like i like to make people feel at home and that's the same thing with my guests so in this case i i'm not able let's say to interact with you but if i would i could um i would do it because i think it's it's much nicer to have a, a constant interaction with you guys um then we go on the second part of it which is much more about um the types of listening that there are so uh, there are five types, uh, let's say more four plus one, 
Um, and this, I say four types of listening because um, not everyone listens to things the same way. We always uh, zoom, zoom out, zoom in, we zoom out, we zoom in. It it's really depends on the situations, on a lot of external factors. But uh, starting from pseudo listening, uh, that is the most basic way of listening, which is basically you're not listening uh, or partially listening. This could be down to a lot of reasons. As I said before, pseudo listening can be easily like someone that comes uh, to an event and then he is particularly interested in, in one speaker. Uh, but before that one speaker, there's another person. So he or she is not really sitting there to hear that person, uh, but uh, they're there, so they have to wait. So they could decide to be a listener or just decide to do pseudo listening. So just kind of like uh, responding, maybe if the speaker does my contact, they'll just probably like nod or something like that, but they're not really listening. This happens also in a lot of informal conversations um uh maybe you have some friends uh, that are pseudo listeners here and there I, everyone's a pseudo listener here and there it's just sometimes you're you have other stimuli that worry you more than whatever the person's speaking about so that's when you decide to to not listen uh the second type of listening is the appreciative and uh, as it's written down it's more listening for enjoyment so this can go music, stand-up comedy, or for example, if you really, really like um, a person, like a celebrity, or there's a, an author that you really like and you go and see the speech, you really admire this person. So you really, really, really just listen and appreciate whatever words, it's like whatever words are coming from their mouths. Uh, it doesn't really happen that often, as I said, in public speaking, because unless you are a very, let's say, famous or very, um, like a thought leader or something like that, uh, then this wouldn't really happen. But it, it can, of course, maybe you have some people that are much more uh, inspired by uh, maybe more people. So you could find also someone being an appreciative listener. Uh, without you being a superstar and um, and I said it's appreciative because you you come there because you really really want to listen to this person or you really like this music or you really like this stand-up comedian the third part is the empathetic one so this is much more related to touching speeches or friends uh, it's not so likely in public speaking although it is um, this is also down to the person. A lot of people are much more empathetic than others, uh, but it's it's not really um, it's hard to empathize with someone who's not talking about their life. For example, uh, it's not the the same thing. So if you're talking about, for example, public speaking, I seriously doubt you'll ever have in this hour an empathetic ear because there's nothing to empathize with. So usually this is. Uh, TEDx of someone maybe who had a very bad um, childhood and then turned it around and made uh, a great success out of their life. This could be someone who you empathize with um, and you think and you can sort of see yourself in their perspective and think like, oh my god, if that would have happened to me, it would have been crazy or something like that. But most of the time is with friends when maybe some friends have uh, problem, family problem, or whatever problem, and then you're listening actively and trying to really uh, feel the same emotions and trying to understand what they're saying and uh, comforting them. Uh, then we have the comprehensive one, which is the one that uh, happens most of the time in public speaking. Well, happens most of the time, the, the, the ideal one, let's say that way. And this is um, listening to actually comprehend and learn what they're saying. So this is, uh, happens pretty much it. <laughs> Sorry about that. We had a little hiccup with, um, with the internet. Um, so as I was saying, uh, the last one, which is uh, critical, it's the plus one type of, uh, of hearing, which it's, some people discuss and say that it's not actually listening. 
because critical, being critical and being sort of judgmental, it doesn't make you listen to the rest of the things you're saying. So, for example, if someone's saying, I have for whatever reason, so you will not have full control. So the most important thing is that you get comfortable with the idea that someone will not listen to you, most probably. Uh, then uh, there's another bit of the receiver, which is about their attention span. Uh, guest, uh, as it's written there, may have other externalities affecting their attention span. And uh, this graph here shows you a little bit how it works. So we have um, the beginning, which is around about 70% uh, of attention level. And uh, I put here the big question, will I be able to get the everyone's full attention? No, you won't. And the long answer is no, you will not, because it's impossible. Um, but as I said, is 70% at the very beginning. And then it goes down to around about, they say, 20% attention level. And then it spikes a couple of times. The spikes are usually due to the fact that you may say something that catches their interest in particular, in a particular way. Maybe you have talked about something that they have uh, maybe read an article about the same morning or something like that, and that would spike their attention. So they would just attention, attention, and then if you kind of like do not continue on that train of thought, then they may lose the attention and go back to 20%. And then generally speaking, when they realize that the speech is about to end, it goes up to 100%. Of course, this is a uh, one way to look at it. Some There's some other people that say that not necessarily you will get 100% uh, attention, which is probably true. It's just as, as an average is usually the attention is much more at the very beginning or at the very end. Um, or either or or at both times. And then in the middle, it's a bit more blurry. Um, this is very common, actually. Uh, there is uh, some very basic, even psychological exercises that if you tell someone 10 things, like it could be 10 types of vegetables, they will very, very, they will remember very probably the very first and the very last, or the, the first two and the last two, because uh, the middle ones get lost in, in in sort of processing all the information. So at the same time, this is exactly what happens in a speech. So you really, really, really want to nail the, I mean, you want to nail the whole speech. That Let's start with that. But you really, really want to nail the beginning and the end because those are going to be the factors influencing uh, the beginning. It will influence how many people will actually follow you throughout uh, your public speech. And the end will actually be the one that sort of, uh, not fairly sometimes, I must say, but it will be the one that the people will remember the most and also the one that will give feedback to you. So sometimes you may find feedback that you may not necessarily agree with. Uh, and a lot of times you have to agree with because that's, you have to, you know, improve yourself. Um, but sometimes it's just that they've picked the last 10 words and one of those 10 words they didn't like, so they're gonna write something else. Um, so during the presentations, the average attention span is about seven minutes, which is extremely short, and it actually gets even shorter uh, when uh, people have lunch. So after lunch, people are a bit sleepier, so they tend to actually go down to five. Um, Another part of the attention span is that if people are sort of very distracted also from their mobile phone, their attention span just drops dramatically. A study had found that their attention span goes down to about seven seconds and uh, seven or eight seconds. And the attention span of a goldfish is actually higher than that. Um, so this is to make you understand how much humans have like short attention spans. Are you gonna be very, you're gonna have to be very, very good at speaking to have everyone engaged throughout the whole speech. You pro I probably lost some of you in these interruptions. For example, these internet problems were noises. So this is probably when the attention span went down. And then I hope that um, the attention span went back up. 
uh, the sender. This is you. In this case, it's me. Uh, and uh, here is, I just wrote a, a small list of things that I believe they're the most important ones, most important ones when uh, a public speech. Uh, and basically starting with uh, first is practice, practice, practice. I will never be able to stress that enough uh, because public speaking is a process and you're going to have to work a whole lot to become a very confident and fluent speaker, uh, public speaker. The second one is be authentic. Uh, this is also incredibly important. Um, if you remember me mentioning at the very beginning of this uh, training, it was that if you learn things by memory, you will not appear authentic. And that is unfortunately, or fortunately, uh, if you have a bad memory like me, um, a good thing um, because if you don't have to memorize things you also don't have to spend as much time remembering every single word but you're gonna have to study a lot the content that's in it you have to be comfortable with the content and you have to be able to uh, speak naturally and have them understand that you're not rehearsing things uh, the third part is the battle language uh, as I said, it's written in the little part. It's not in order of importance. Just the first one is the most important because everyone has to practice to get better. The body language is incredibly important because, as I said before, when people uh, perceive you, they don't just perceive your voice or your words. They perceive your body language, your emotions. Um, so it's incredibly important that your body, you actually pay a lot of attention to your body language. Uh, the fourth one is actually be excited. You have to do something that's interesting to you. I find public speaking fascinating. I find communication fascinating. And I just enjoy the process. So I'm excited to be here today. And I hope you're, you're, you're feeling uh, this excitement of mine. Because you have to do something that you generally like. Because if you go out and do a speech of something that is so dry for you that you don't really like, then it will appear to your audience. Uh, the fifth one is the message that he or she delivers. So in this case, you guys, um, that's incredibly important because the message is the backbone, let's say in a way, of, of your performance. So it's what you say and uh, what, you not, what you don't say. Um, so make sure that your message is uh, very, very, how do you say, clear. The sixth one is timing and tone. Uh, so timing and tone is a very interesting thing because if I told you, um, hey, hi guys, um, I'm very excited today. Um, uh, yeah, I, I can't wait to be here. Uh, that is something that clearly shows that I am saying that I'm excited, but I my voice doesn't look excited, doesn't seem excited. So you clearly send a mixed message to your audience and you want the message as clear as possible. So you're just going to confuse your audience. And yet again, they're going to think you're not authentic. So you have to make sure that your tone of voice matches the speech, matches your body language. So there's a lot to think about. But I swear that the more you do it, the more it comes naturally. So you less have to think about, uh, oh my God, I used the wrong tone of voice. Just use as you would normally speak to your friends, because I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't tell your friends, hey, I am so happy to see you. Because you just don't. You would probably be very excited when you haven't seen a friend for a long time. The fifth one is, sorry, seventh one. Uh, there's a repetition. Uh, dealing with nerves, uh, you have to be able to handle you have to make sure that you also get yourself out there and enjoy the experience because nerves are going to be the one that could necessarily just make you freeze and just make you stop there. Sixth one is be confident. Even then, being confident, as I always say, it's uh, it's more of a self-belief and believing that you are confident and things like that and telling yourself you're good enough with this things like that that can work um i feel like some people are more confident by nature some people are less confident but it's important to be confident when you're public speaking because people have to trust you people have to think hey uh okay i like this guy or this girl uh he's doing a great job he's confident i like the way he moves and he speaks blah 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 so that brings a whole lot of experience to the audience as well. So you definitely want to be working on that confidence because you, you're definitely 
already great because I know that you, you guys and junior entrepreneurs in general are already very, very uh, hands-on and good. But you also have to convince yourself more and more that you can do things and you can do them properly. Uh, the sender, the authenticity, uh, how do I appear authentic? Uh, as I said, this is one of the key parts because it's extremely, uh, I find it easy to find, to understand if someone's being authentic or not. Uh, I think it's more of a human uh, thing to, to understand if someone's sort of not speaking the truth. Uh, so how do you appear authentic? This is very easy. Uh, well, very easy to take. Uh, you're gonna have to be sorry, Sarah messaged me. I think, yeah, the video stopped now. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. Okay. And yet again, we have my terrible internet ruining everything. <laughs> so going back to the authenticity bit. And... Sorry, Sarah. No, it is okay. Continue. Okay, I'll continue. Um, so uh, first thing to appear authentic is to match your body language with your speech. Uh, first of all, I, I think I said this already, and it's very important that your tone of voice, your body language, and your, your words, your verbal language, they actually match. Because if your tone of voice doesn't match your body language, nor your speech, then it, it is actually quite hard to, if you're natural about it, it's actually quite hard to have all the three things mixed up. Uh, you want to match your body language, especially when you're explaining something to an audience. You generally do not want to put your hands like this or your hands in your pockets. You want to keep your hands open. Your Usually your palms are up in the, they open up, uh, they, they're looking towards the ceiling. You're always opening your arms because you want people to feel welcome. You want people to, to you want them to embrace you and you want to embrace them. So it's uh, it's very important that the body language is is there. Second part is learn the content thoroughly, but avoid memorizing it. I said this many, many times already. Do not memorize it word by word because it will make it unnatural. Uh, also, one thing uh, that I suggest, uh, going back to the, the graph before, it's if you really, really want to memorize something, uh, you shouldn't, by the way, but if you want to know, like, maybe uh, an intro or a conclusion, word by word, then you're going to have to memorize it, and then you're going to really have to rehearse it and rehearse it until it comes natural. Um, so the beginning and the end, as I said before, are the most uh, important bits, usually because they're the ones that people actually remember, uh, or at least remember the most. So you really want to nail the beginning and the end. And if memorizing it makes you feel better, maybe do that. But you're really going to have to work hard to make it sound natural. Uh, the tone of voice should match the context in your message. As I said before, tone and timing. The number four, you have to enjoy your time on the stage. It's I understand that it's, it's a very feared activity, public speaking and staying on stage, having a um, bunch of eyes looking at you. Uh, the thing is, you really have to enjoy it. You have to enjoy your time there and just think about it as a great opportunity, a great experience for you to grow. And if you start looking at the positive sides of public speaking rather than being it uh, a hustle, then you can definitely uh, make it the best time on, on your stage. Uh, five, if you make a mistake, use it to your advantage. As I was making the point before, we're all humans, we'll make mistake. And if you do make a mistake, that try and not think about, oh my God, I made a mistake, oh my God, this happened. So that in that moment, you have basically, if you start thinking like that in that moment, you have ruined your speech because your attention is not on the speech or the content or your audience, it's actually on you and the fact that you've done something wrong. Don't do that. Try and avoid. It's it's normal to be very critical with yourself. But if you do a speech, go forward, continue with your speech, because three seconds after you already forgot about it. But most importantly, you can actually use that to your advantage because the audience will perceive you as a human being and more natural and more less artificial. 
the last part is that actually you show your sense of humor uh, here and then. I don't think that you always have to force it. Actually forcing it, it's not very good. Uh, of course, also the context is very important. So don't try and be funny where you shouldn't try and be funny. Um, and uh, if you do have a joke that comes up, just say it if it's relevant, of course, and if it's within the boundaries of being normal. <laughs> But yeah, try and use your jokes, because jokes make people laugh, everyone likes to laugh, uh, everyone likes humor, it just makes you feel more at home and comfortable. Then we got the message. The message is the core process of the communication, uh, the core, sorry, the core part of the communication process. It includes both verbal and non-verbal, so as I was saying before, it's both uh, talking and both moving your body, using your tone of voice, there's plenty of things that are included in the message. Uh, it has a clear outcome, so as I said, you should know very, very, very well what is the underlying uh, message that you want to say. So you may have a 15-minute speech, but in this 15-minute speech you may have those 50, 100 words that are the most important ones in your speech that you really, really want people to understand and feel so just know and understand what's your uh, outcome in your speech um it must bring some sort of value to the audience uh to be listened to so of course you, you you gotta have something that's useful for them in a way so for example today in this training i'm telling well i'm teaching you or showing you how uh what to look at when you're doing public speaking what's important and what's less important uh, so I hope that I'm bringing some value to you, and uh, at the same time, I hope you're listening. Uh, the fifth part is, it is actually the reason why you're on that stage. So if someone told you to do a training, or someone told you to do a, a keynote speech, uh, your role in that room, or in this case, my room, because it's, uh, we're, we're, you know, this whole period thing, uh, we work together, me and whoever the person that invited or who invited you or invited me to make sure that, you know, you're there for a reason, you're bringing value. And so make sure to have your content relevant and polished. So when I say polished is don't bring a draft of your speech to your final audience, bring the real, real final speech, have 10 drafts. I don't know how many times you need to rewrite a speech but the important part is that you have a very, very good speech that is relevant and it will actually bring value to the audience. Structuring your message, where to start. So this is, I, I wanted to make it as pragmatic as possible. Of course, I can't write a speech here because it would be a bit long and I wouldn't even know what to write about. Uh, so I'm mostly doing a step-by-step -step guide to understand what to approach first and what to do later and, and whatnot. So uh, here is, I have found the underlying message, so I know what I, uh, I want to talk about and I know that this is the sort of message I want to bring to my audience. So first of all, write it down. Just make sure you take a piece of paper or take your laptop and write the message down. Understand that you have to, as I said, carry this message along. So make sure you have it very clear in your head what the message is. Once you have that message, write down a final outcome you want to out of your public speech. If there's something that you're trying to obtain, or if there's, it's just like, it could be something personal. It doesn't have to be something monetary or whatever. This don't, don't get me wrong. It can be personal satisfaction. What, what is the outcome you want to get out of the speech? Do you want to overcome your fears or do you want to ensure that the audience is pleased? Uh, do you want to, what, whatever it is, just write it down. Uh, once you've identified uh, your main message and your final outcome, start identifying the different elements in your main message. So uh, to make uh, an example, if I'm talking about um, entrepreneurship and uh, the future of entrepreneurship, and uh, I'm trying to maybe convince uh, an audience that the best way, sorry about that, uh, the best way to go forward is to I don't know, introduce entrepreneurship in high school. Uh, that could be my main message. That's what I want. And I understand that there's a bunch of elements. There's entrepreneurship, 
there is education, there is the future. So you can try and depict the different elements and then you can try on as a 3.4, divide them in a logical manner. So if I'm trying to talk about, uh, I want to, my final aim is I want to introduce uh, to a, a bunch of policy makers that they have to put um, entrepreneurship classes in high school. I know that first things first, you have to maybe look at the past. So I'll make a, I'll make a small paragraph about the past. Uh, and then I'll contrast it with how the world has changed today. Uh, and then I will uh, talk about how entrepreneurship is important for the future. And then the last paragraph, I can talk about entrepreneurship and education and how important it would be to create a better society in the future. This is just something that I just made out in my head right now, but it may gives you an idea on how you should structure it. Then fifth, build your bridges transition between paragraphs i have uh, a couple of slides after just the bridges so uh, i'll talk about that a bit later uh number six draft the main body of your speech uh so once you have all that down you have the different elements you have you know that you have to have five four six paragraphs whatever it is draft the main body uh draft it out and after you draft it out write the introduction and the conclusion uh, I usually do this. This is a bit subjective. I just find it much, much easier to write a compelling introduction and conclusion after I wrote the main body because I know the main body very thoroughly. I wrote it down. I know what the ideas are. I know how to introduce it now and I want to conclude it in a special way so I actually know what the main body is and I can conclude it better. So I usually do this. Uh, of course, this is a bit more subjective, but I, I think this is probably the best way. I think most of you guys maybe do it also for your essays. Um, yeah, so uh, number eight, if possible, create some slides for support for your verbal uh, communication. This is because uh, there's a very um, simple study that I can show you, that's point two, uh, that showed that actually after three days um, that some people attended a uh, public speech. Most people recall 10% of a only verbal presentation, uh, 35% of a visual one and 65% uh, if you use both verbal and visual information. So that's 6.5 times if you just use a verbal presentation. So of course not in every occasion you can introduce slides, but if you can just, and I'm not talking about reading off the slides, I'm talking about using slides as a visual reminder for your audience. Uh, then, use storytelling. This is a great, great way to make your speech more relatable and enjoyable. There's plenty of people who do storytelling. Tony Robbins, one of the best coaches in the world, life coaches in the world. Uh, Obama used to make a great storytelling. If you go and look at his speech in the two, I believe it was 2004, uh, that was the first time Obama ever came out in the sort of spotlight. It was the first time he spoke to a large crowd, I think it was in Boston. Uh, and he used, uh, he used his story, his personal story, to present himself to the American people. So I found that that is actually my favorite speech. I really recommend you to, uh, to actually watch some of that. Uh, the third part is use some facts and figures. So as I did before, for example, I used a graph to show you the attention levels during the, uh, during the speech. Uh, I didn't put so many figures and facts beside, for example, the statistics on top because a lot of public speaking is not so quantitative, uh, it's much more qualitative. Uh, but yes, it definitely helps to put here and then a couple of graphs and slides just to aid uh, your, your, your part. Um, then we have, we have uh, videos. Uh, videos also can regain the attention of your audience. Uh, videos can be short, can be I wouldn't say long because then you lose the attention anyway. If they're short videos to just get the attention again of your people, that it's great. Uh, and then engage with your audience. As I said, today we are not uh, necessarily engaging in a Q&A, but we'll be engaging in a Q&A at the end of the session. Uh, but if you have, uh, if you feel like you should ask a question, ask it. It doesn't matter. The more you engage with the audience, the better it is. It keeps them engaged. And maybe you also find something interesting from the audience that you hadn't thought about. Uh, the bridges. Uh, so most undivided elements. I find this incredibly important. Imagine a city 
uh, divided in let's say three, four, five bits, and there's very terrible bridges connecting them. Imagine, w would you really, really, really trust that bridge, or would you not really? Because good bridges really keep the listeners engaged. But repetitive, as I said there, the repetitive bad transitions actually promote the good listeners. So if you're trying to transition from one uh, paragraph to another, you will have the problem that uh, if you don't think about how to transition and you transition badly, people will misunderstand what you're talking about because they they didn't really think about how oh, huh, we're talking about something different. So if you don't have your bridges done right, you will definitely lose attention. This is incredibly important. So as I said there, it maintains the focus on the content. So you talked about maybe five minutes, you talked about um, education, and then you transition on to entrepreneurship, but people do not follow. So they still think you're talking about education, but you're talking about entrepreneurship. So there's a mismatch and this is the problem with then with the decoding part the audience doesn't really perceive the message the way you want them to perceive it uh so and then i mean the example really would you rather trust to go from a to b so let's say from point a point b of your city and there's a bridge connecting them and there's a very terrible bridge it looks ugly it's just not it doesn't look very safe so would you rather go from A to B with that or with a very nice bridge that's nice, it's fluent, and then you can just go on to the next part. It's kind of the same thing in public speaking. So make sure you don't underestimate your bridges because those are incredibly important. Uh, then we got rhetorical figures. Uh, we got the last couple of, of things. Rhetorical figures are when you really want to evolve your speech. So this they come at the very end. Uh, when do you add them ready is once you've finalized your speech. Uh, once you've done your drafts, you've done your main body, you've done your introduction, you've done your conclusion, then you go and look at it again and you go, okay, how can I make it even better? I like the speech, it's good, it's my basic, my final draft. How can I add some rhetorical figures to make it better? And how do I identify where to add them? That's, um, that's up to you really. Uh, there's no scientific way to identify um, the best uh, rhetorical figure to include, but you want to put rhetorical figures when you want to focus or stress something in particular. So if you have a particular achievement of your company or your enterprise or whatever it is that you want to really stress, then that's where you can add a rhetorical figure. Or you can add a rhetorical figure when you do not want to sound harsh. And let me explain a bit better. Uh, so what uh, speeches, figures of speech or rhetorical figures should I use? The first one that's probably one of uh, the most common and the most catchy in public speaking is alliteration. This is where you repeat the first letter of a word in more than one word. So I, I put the example here, Paolo is a profound person. There's three Ps in five words. And it really stresses the fact that Paolo is a profound person. I could have said Paolo is a very smart and intellectual person. If I said that, okay, that, that's, that's something. But if I say Paolo is a very profound person, it's, it kind of stresses the fact that Paolo is a very deep and very um, maybe sincere person. I don't know. But uh, it stresses the fact that Paolo has this particular characteristic. Uh, the second part, uh, the second uh, figure of speech is amplification. So this is when you actually stress a specific um, word. Is actually a word, it's not work. <laughs> to amplify, it's important. So instead of saying, hey, I had a great time in this place with my friends, da 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 da, you can just say, I had this amazing holiday in an amazing place with my amazing friends stress the word amazing and it just makes it more real it makes it really it was so good i had this ice cream which tasted good looked good it's just repeating the word so you amplify and amplify the meaning of it stressing the fact that the word is important or whatever uh, then we got the anadiplosis uh, so basically it's as it's written there, it's just ending an idea to begin a new one. So the example here is she opened that shop and that shop brought her fortunes. It kind of seems like amplification because you're repeating in this case the word shop, 
but it's just repeating the ending of a word with a new, the ending of, a, of an idea, a train of thought into a new one. So that will also stress a little bit if you have to say something in particular. Then we go euphemism. And this is what I was talking about when you don't want to sound rude or harsh or you don't want to be judged in any way. So this is a way to convey uh, something that's not so pleasant and make it sound more pleasant than it is. So here I made the example of brass sleepers and homeless. Homeless, for example, it's uh, a word that is commonly used uh, around the world, although it's not the best word to call someone who doesn't have a house. Uh, so instead of calling them homeless, you can call them rough sleepers. So if I'm talking about, um, I don't know, I, I'm in a social enterprise and I'm helping uh, rough sleepers get back into society, I will refer to them as rough, rough sleepers, not homeless, because some people may have a problem with that, fairly so, and they will actually start judging you, and they will go into the plus one types of listing, which is the critical one, and you don't want that to happen. Uh, then we have, for example, less fortunate rather than poor. Poor people is also not a nice word to say, so you want to avoid saying words that can be judged by others. You want to find their alternative. And um, another trick to make um, something more appealing uh, is the rule of three. So instead of saying, uh, hey, uh, we've done a great year, it was amazing. This is something good, uh, but saying, hey, this year we managed to deliver products that are better, faster, and cheaper. So these three things, repetition of three, it's something that uh, catches the audience very well. There's plenty of uh, YouTube videos and TEDx that where they actually use the rule of three, that you can hear it once you maybe go through these slides again and start thinking about these things consciously, you will actually realize that in a lot of public speeches, they use all these rules. Then we got uh, repetition. Uh, repetition is kind of uh, similar to the uh, the plosis. It's just repeating uh, the word or a concept to stress it out. So in here, I, I tend to forget the small things, but the small things are the ones that count. It's just repeating the word, the word small things uh, to stress it out. Um, then let's go into the do's and don'ts. And uh, first of all, some good practices. Let's talk about the good parts and uh, practice body language. Uh, by looking at other people's speeches on YouTube. I watched, um, I don't even know how many speeches I watched, I watched on YouTube. I love uh, president's speeches. I found them very powerful. I think uh, Obama is a great example. So as I said, once you finished out this training, and I also appreciate the fact that you kind of want to learn more about it, don't stop here. Uh, go on YouTube. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of videos. Uh, let's see here, thousands and thousands and thousands, the repetition of three plus the repetition of the word. Um, or videos that teach you these things. Um, then second part is make flashcards or acronyms to aid your memory. Flashcards are perfectly fine to use. I don't, generally, I don't like to go on the stage with a bunch of papers, uh, but I don't mind going with a, some little flashcards. So I think that's that's quite useful for you and the acronyms as well. I used to do this ex mostly to remember the different paragraphs uh, and I used to make acronyms with the very the beginning or the concept uh, that I had in each paragraph. So let's say if I spoke about um, future, uh, no, yeah, future education and, um, and something else I would take the word, the small words, the, the first letter, and then make a um, make a word to remember it. Uh, then we have the third is make sure you have smooth transitions between sections. So as I said, don't forget the bridges. Bridges are incredibly important. And if you have those very, very polished, you will have a much, much better uh, public speaking experience. Uh, if possible, ask for a hands-free microphone. This also subjective but it's much 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 better to speak with two free hands than only one if you're speaking with one hand uh and have the microphone with the on the other one it's it i mean it's it's okay it's not bad but if they do have a hands-free one use it because it will allow you to gesture more and make yourself and make your audience feel more
um, number five, which is number four here, it's time your speech and have an idea of where you should be at specific times. So here is simply knowing that if I'm running out of time, for example, today, I am 20 minutes after, well, I planned it for an hour. We had, uh, unfortunately, some interruptions. So I'm still on time, but uh, you wanna make sure that you know uh, where you wanna be and at what point. Some bad practices. Don't put your hands in your pocket when performing. Don't cross your arms. I did not put it here, uh, but do not cross your arms and do not put your hands in your pocket. And your pocket is way too casual, especially if you're trying to deliver a public speech. You do not want to just chill about. Um, avoid humming when thinking. Silence is better. Uh, this is the thing I was saying. Humming is the just mm, uh, mm, being indecisive. You don't want to be indecisive. It's better silence just take home take a couple of seconds three four seconds recompose yourself and start again um number three is do not over rehearse you will sound not authentic if you're over rehearse you probably end up also memorizing uh, the speech and that will make you not sound natural uh the fourth is um Avoid making the speech about you uh, unless you have relevant examples or the speech requires you to. So if it's uh, if you're presenting something about your true enterprise, avoid start talking about yourself in whatever way because it's not really relevant and people do not care. Um, so in this case, I threw in some examples in my experience just because I wanted to add to the speaking experience and, and to make you understand that some things are normal, some things are just, you know, you need to practice. So try and avoid making too many points about yourself or whatever, because it's not necessarily the, the, the angle of the speech and why the people are there. And the last one, but really much not the least, is avoid any political, religious or unnecessary comments, because most likely it will just have people to, it will, it, it will just, throw people all away because everyone not everyone has political stands or religious stands but most people do and if you start making political comments they will stop and i can assure you that they will stop listening to you they will just start judging whatever you've said because they may not have been you know uh, along the same lines and uh this is it uh for me so I hope you guys enjoyed this and I apologize uh, for the couple of hiccups we had uh, in the, um, uh, uh, during the day with internet. So I hope uh, that you have some questions and I'm here uh, with you guys. So just let me know if you have any questions. I have the chat that's live right now so I can see the questions. And uh, if you don't have any questions, then uh, that'll be the end for today. So I'm just going to wait a couple of minutes for you guys to to start thinking and uh, really try and ask some questions because they're getting, definitely going to be useful. Okay, so have any questions? Um, maybe let's wait another minute. If not, then close it. So in the meantime, while you uh, guys think about your questions, I'm just gonna re-skim through really quickly. So speakers are not born, uh, they're made. Speeches must not be memorized. A small audience is better than a big one. As I said, this is a bit, uh, a bit subjective. Perfection is key not the truth perfection is not the key your message is the key and silence is bad silence is actually good you just gotta know how to hold it it's a process um you know it's gotta be iterated uh, this is the whole communication process these are the different parts of the communication process the receiver the audience they're the most important people in the room at that point 
uh, they're your guests, so make sure to please them. Types of listening, you want to try and promote comprehensive and uh, listening and not really, you don't want to come, we don't want to have pseudo listener in there. Uh, best type of listening is a comprehensive where's the pseudo listener, attention span, very, very high at the beginning, drops in the middle, very high at the end. So make sure to have your beginnings and your ends on point. The middle, it's got to be on point too, but if it's not, people probably won't remember as much. The sender is you, so make sure to practice, make sure to be authentic and watch out your body language big time. It's very, very important. Authenticity, as I said, match your body language, your tone and your speech together. Uh, avoid memorizing the speech and if you make a mistake really use it to your advantage the message is the core part it's both verbal and non-verbal and it has a clear outcome so you want to make sure you have it very polished to structure it write down the message write down the outcome identify the different elements and then start um start uh, dividing these elements and then draft the main body build the bridges write introduction and conclusion how can you increase the attention span storytelling slides videos facts and figures that will definitely help you guys out the bridge is extremely important make sure you have those bridges in make sure that you know how to transition people from a to b so make sure to do that rhetorical figures Make sure to add them. It's not necessary. You don't want to necessarily add them. Most probably you're going to have a couple that you're going to do naturally. You don't even realize, but make sure to add them if you want to evolve your speech to a different level. Alliteration, amplification, underpluses, and euphemism are probably the most common figures of speech used. Use the rule of three. Repeat three times something or a repetition. And do's and don'ts. We just went through them. So practice body language. Use flashcards and make sure the transitions are very smooth in your in your speech bad practices don't put your hands in your pocket avoid humming do not order hers and avoid unnecessary comments anyway so thank you thank you so much guys uh for being here today i apologize yet again for the internet connections the delays and whatnot we had some issues but at the end of the day we managed so 